The following program is brought to you by Stetson University College of Law, the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law, and was funded by the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance Capital Case Litigation Initiative. Welcome to Electronic Evidence Essentials, the eighth in our series of webinars for the Bureau of Justice Assistance Capital Litigation Initiative Crime Scene to Courtroom Forensics Training. This webinar is produced by the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law and the Office of Professional Education at Stetson. I'm your host, Carol Henderson. I'm a professor of law at Stetson College of Law and the director of the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law. Today's webinar will provide attorneys with a general and legal overview of electronic evidence. Our expert panel will discuss the importance of digital evidence and outline the multimedia disciplines recognized by the OSAC, the Organization of Scientific Area Committees for Forensic Science. The panelists will address the legal perspective of digital evidence, including the different types of electronic data, case law and rules surrounding electronic evidence and obtaining access to electronic evidence. We'll also explore the electronic evidence collection process from seizure of evidence through forensic analysis. Our experts will offer tips for selecting and working with digital forensic experts and provide insight into legal considerations that may impact courtroom proceedings. Joining Pinte on the panel are Josh Brunty and Mark Rash. Josh is a professor in the Department of Forensic Sciences at Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Professor Brunty teaches in the areas of digital forensics and information assurance and focuses his research in digital forensics, mobile device forensics, network forensics, and image and video forensics. He earned his BA in criminal justice from Marshall University and his Master of Science in criminal justice with an emphasis in digital forensics information security from Marshall University. Prior to entering academia, Professor Brunty managed digital forensic research and case law laboratories at the Marshall University Forensic Science Center. He also worked as an examiner with the West Virginia State Police Digital Forensic Unit. Mark Rash is the principal at Rash Technology and Cyber Law, where he offers litigation consulting and counseling services in the area of cyber law. During his tenure with Verizon Enterprise Solutions, he was in charge of strategy and messaging for global security solutions. He received his JD from the State University of New York College at Buffalo in 1983. Early in his career, he worked with the U.S. Department of Justice, where he started the Computer Crime Unit, which eventually led to the creation of the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section of the Criminal Division. Mr. Rash went on to serve as Chief Privacy Officer for Science Application International Organization and Director of various information security consulting companies. Mr. Rash also taught in the fields of cybersecurity, Law, Policy, and Technology at the University of Maryland, George Mason University, Georgetown University, and American University College of Law. I would like to talk a minute about our chat feature. While the webinar is in progress, you can chat with us at any time. Please use the chat feature found on the right-hand side of your login screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as possible. Note that we may not get to all your questions while on air. However, we will answer all the questions that you send to us, and a Q&A document will be sent to all participants by email. You also will receive, because it's designed for both prosecutors and defense attorneys, continuing legal education information. Attendees who complete this webinar will be eligible for CLE credits. The Stetson Office of Professional Education will work with each individual participant for reporting specifics, 
CLE applications will be made to the state of Florida and other states per individual request. Please email OPE at law.stetson.edu for further information and state your specific request. Josh will be the first speaker, and we wanted to talk because we have such a wide array of electronic devices and digital data used on a daily basis by criminals to commit crimes and by law enforcement to solve crimes. I'm sure many of you are aware of Locard's exchange principle that says that every contact leaves a trace in a physical crime scene. But does the same hold true in the area of cyber crime and electronic evidence? Josh, in light of the rapid pace of technological advances, can you establish a foundation for us to understand the importance of digital forensic evidence? I can. Thank you, Carol. So I wanted to speak to you today on the process of digital forensic science and why that's important to us. Um, it is, just to define it, uh, what we know as digital forensic science, a branch of forensic science that encompasses the recovery the investigation and the material found on what we refer to as digital evidence. Uh, and most of the time that's often in relation to computer crime. Now, understanding that, we have to establish that digital forensics is a scientific process. And like many other specializations in forensic science, uh, DNA, chemistry, uh, other basic subdisciplines that we've known of for years, uh, the digital multimedia subdiscipline uh, is challenged with respect to demonstrating the processes, activities, and the techniques that we deem as scientific. So uh, that's been a very difficult thing to do in light of the changing uh, lightning pace of digital forensic evidence or digital evidence in general. Now, in practice, digital multimedia evidence serves as the investigative, the procedural, the scientific functions and the outcomes of these multiple mo modalities. And then we synthesize those or break those down into what we refer to as expert opinions and even conclusions. Now, in response to a 2009 National Academy of Sciences report that challenged a lot of the forensic science disciplines, uh, one of the areas that was challenged was digital forensics. And one of the things that was challenged was the lack of standardization and the lack of best practices, which is pretty well understood for a, a, a particular field that doesn't have, uh, that hasn't been out there for a long time. So in response to that, in 2014, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the Department of Justice uh, developed what we refer to as the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, which we refer to as OSAC. Uh, that was a collaborative body of around 600 forensic science practitioners and experts who represent local, state, federal agencies, academia, and industry. And for example, I'm an, uh, a member of the Digital Evidence Subcommittee uh, as an academic member. And there's folks from private sector, law enforcement, uh, and, and even uh, the legal community who come together uh, to work on this particular committee. So one of the last areas that was added into this was uh, digital evidence. Now, another thing, they established OSAC to create a sustainable organizational structure. Uh, that is to provide consensus documentary standards and guidelines to improve the quality and consistency of work in the forensic science community. And that's one of the baseline underpinnings of what we do is to try to establish standards or even best practices for our examiners to follow because sometimes uh, that can be uh, muddy waters whenever we're down into the trenches working with this. And this is an overview of the scientific area committees that exist. Uh, if you see up in the top corner there, uh, the left-hand corner, you'll see highlighted in purple that there is a digital multimedia evidence subcommittee or, or a committee as we refer to and broken out within that particular digital multimedia uh, scientific committee is what we refer to as the four subcommittees. Uh, first being digital evidence, facial recognition, speaker recognition, and then video and imaging technology and, and analysis. Now, to understand the scientific foundations of digital multimedia evidence and how this all fits into forensic science, it's necessary to consider these specializations and understand what they actually mean. Uh, this is 
encompasses all the subdisciplines which I'll speak to you about today. And this is the current OSAC organizational structure. And we'll discuss what those four areas are. Now, the first one is digital evidence. Now, digital multimedia evidence is probably the one that we're most familiar with. That's the handling of digital traces for forensic purposes. That includes the classification, the identification of items. Uh, for example, you know, what's, what's a Word document? What is a, an image file? And the different types of image files. Sometimes that is difficult in digital forensics. It's just identifying what type of file may be relevant to a case. Activity reconstruction, where a person may have been based upon data that's on their device. Uh, who was that the particular person that put the data on that device? For example, um, we all seem to be walking around with smart watches and Fitbits and things like that. Pulling and extracting that information may be relevant in our case. Uh, also detection of manipulation. Uh, that could be authentication of a digital document. Uh, that could also be detection of uh, was a photo altered in many cases, which sometimes uh, can be rather difficult to determine whether that alteration took place. Also, even concealment of evidence. This is more deletion of evidence, uh, data that has been scrubbed from a computer or has inadvertently been deleted from a server or something like that. Pulling that data back and being able to reconstruct that that would hold up in a court of law. Now, understanding in the current OSAC uh, structure of this, and if you're going out and looking at uh, some of these OSAC subdisciplines, uh, note that the audio recordings, or what we refer to as audio forensics, they're treated as a form of digital evidence, which is totally separate from speaker recognition, which I'll, I'll speak on here in just a second. Uh, those are usually split out for purposes of enhancement and authentication purposes. So, for example, um, you know, enhancing audio so it can be better heard or either authenticating audio that it came from a particular device. Now, the next subcommittee that exists is facial identification. This is and involves the handling of photographs, videos contained uh, maybe with an unknown face for comparison. Uh, this is, uh, this could be compared against facial images in a database with, it, with or without a known subject. Uh, and, and we normally reserve that for forensic identification purposes. Now, it's important to understand in facial identification that in order for a database, I think, to, um, to be valid, usually there are empirical studies that validate and find those to be accurate. So those are things to look for, especially if you're looking against facial recognition databases. Those, in many cases, can be quantified. And it's important to know what the quantification of, of matches may be. Now, a question that commonly pops up is, what's the purpose of an examiner in this? Why do we have an examiner and analyst still going back and doing facial identification? Well, for example, uh, under ideal circumstances, looking at, at and comparing two mugshots in a facial rec database may be rather easy. But in real world application, that doesn't always matter. In some cases, you may have your subject that is uh, taken at an angle in a video. You could be dealing with excessive light that would change that. Uh, age, weight gain sometimes factors in and can cause a lower baseline score with facial identification. So it's important to bring an analyst in there to mitigate some of those uh, particular lower scores and put some human eyes on it in many cases. Now, and, Josh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Josh, but I was wondering um, with these uh, databases with facial identification, is there an international database? Or I know Interpol probably has a database, I would think, but how do you know like which database to search? That's a really good question. And if you're looking at validation of databases, one of the places you really want to go and look at is first to see if there's an ISO standard that exists for this. And uh, explain, because not everybody will know what ISO, ISO is. ISO stands for the uh, International Standard Organization of Standardization. So, for example, ISO could, you know, there's an ISO standard that um, exists for how a forensic laboratory should be run. Uh, you can look out there if there's really nothing that matches to that facial database. Uh, you could also look at ASTM. Uh, ASTM is a voluntary organization that uh, publishes standards and best practices for a lot of these sub-disciplines that we'll talk about. And if you can't find anything there, then contact the vendor directly because the vendor will have internal validations or they should have internal validations that show the consistency and validation of their own database. Okay. If that doesn't exist, then uh, 
you might be looking at, at something you know that may not be technically valid mm -hmm. and a lot of people just question don't even question that some of these you know don't maybe not measure what they're supposed to be measuring so it's a good question nonetheless okay. so the next uh, subcommittee that we're looking at is speaker recognition. Now, speaker recognition involves the handling of voice recordings. This is different from audio forensics, uh, but this handles recordings in analog or digital form, including the comparison of voice recordings with a known speaker for forensic purposes, comparison of a known voice recordings of unknown speakers, and counting the number of speakers on a voice recording, and also involves the segmenting of that voice into segments by the speaker the speaker, a process that we know of as diarization. Now diarization, if I were to explain that in layman's terms, is basically taking, if you had two overlapping voices in a particular recording, being able to split those separate audio channels out and distinguish one speaker from the other. That's a common practice that's done. Now in the current OSAC structure, uh, we're supposed to be vetting these particular standards uh, to publish to the OSAC registry. To my knowledge, we have not vetted from the Speaker Recognition Subcommittee any standards or best practices from that just yet. That doesn't mean that they're not coming or it's just in a stalemate. It means that they're still in the document vetting process because this is really uh, one of those fields that's probably going to get challenged the most in forensic science, at least from a from perspective. So probably within the next couple of years, you'll see some stuff being published uh, from that particular subject. So right now, there's absolutely no standards that have been published I looked yet. this morning, and there, there may be standards that are published. They just have not been vetted by the OSAC subcommittee okay. just yet. So that doesn't mean that it's invalid because you don't see it on the OSAC structure. That just means that it hasn't been through the vetting process by that subcommittee just okay. yet. And this is run by NIST. That's yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Now, also, uh, the principles developed for testing the performance of speaker recognition have evolved into an international standard or an ISO standard, per se, uh, for those biometric modalities and applications. So those are things to look at if you're bringing a, a speaker recognition expert into the mix uh, to look for uh, and, and reference to those ISO standards. That way you know what uh, general direction that your expert's coming from and how they drew those particular conclusions. Now, the next subcommittee that exists is the Video and Imaging Technology and Analysis. Uh, this is the handling of images and videos for forensic purposes, and that usually includes classification and identification of items such as comparing an image in a video with a known item. For example, if you have two uh, separate CCTV videos with a, the same individual, doing almost like an ACE-V comparison, uh, as you would in fingerprint comparison, but uh, bringing an analyst in to draw a particular expert conclusion um, against those known items. Now that goes a little bit deeper than that because you're looking at clothing identification. Uh, you can also look at uh, authenticating license plates, so comparing license plates in two separate uh, videos and, and then drawing expert conclusion from there. Uh, even cars, for example, bringing experts in to analyze two cars taken in two separate videos to determine if that was the same car or a different car based upon models and trims and things like that that we normally run into. Now, this also gets into the authentication of images and videos and most notably uh, metadata analysis. For example, EXIF data uh, that's taken from images can tell where a picture was taken, what, the, what camera a particular picture was taken at. The elevation in some cases can be taken and in some cases it'll even tell what the flash settings of that camera are. So there's a lot of information in the metadata and I define this to my students as data about data. So it's that internal data that sometimes tells more of the story about the picture than the picture itself. There's also what we call photo response non-uniformity and to break that down into layman's terms, PRNU, is basically the fingerprint left behind by the photo when it was taken. Uh, for example, a lot of digital cameras have what we call embedded CCD chip, which is uh, basically takes the place of film. Cameras can leave a unique fingerprint based upon those CCD uh, chips that's embedded within that camera. For example, just embedded in the photo can tell us what if we were able to determine that based upon a database, if that camera took that picture or not. And, and even the same manufacturer of cameras, uh, if we were to put them side by side, may leave that fingerprint behind in those particular um, 
in those uh, particular images that they take. Now this is an evolving standard. This is something, or not a standard per se, but this is an evolving part of science. So it's rather new. We, we're still trying to get this out of its infancy and as a lot of digital evidence is. But, uh, and even the, the detection and manipulation, which is uh, seeming uh, to be a, a bigger and bigger problem, especially with videos now, uh, to determine whether CGI has been brought into play or if uh, the video hasn't been altered at all on that. And what's CGI? CGI is computer generated animations. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if you've seen in the news lately uh, where they're taking videos now and superimposing uh, movie stars' heads on them yeah. and then posting them to pornographic websites. They're almost as real as, as normal faces. And, and that can be an issue, especially when you're dealing with child pornography or even identifying or, or trying to implicate a suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that to be something that will pop up in the, in the near future, especially as the CGI methods uh, become more and more available to the consumer market. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that can be a, a big concern in trial litigation down the road. The of, planted evidence, basically. Exactly, right. exactly. So uh, that's something that really is just now starting to get on the radar, but you're going to see more and more of that uh, pop up here in the, the near future. At least I, I, I would see that being. You're also dealing with uh, video and imaging technology of dealing with uh, the operational techniques, following a certain procedure. Uh, for example, DVRs are all different. They run Linux operating systems. They're sometimes difficult to get the videos from. Uh, so following that uh, operational technique from start to finish of how to extract that video properly, how to put that in a proper format, and then how to effectively report that in a court of law that's acceptable under the federal rules of evidence can be uh, sometimes, a, sometimes a monumental task for the examiner in of itself uh, when you're dealing with an enhancement or restoration. Now, this comes down to, and, and especially with, with some of the, um, the stuff that I do with mobile forensics, there's so many tools and so many methods that we can point to this. For example, uh, when dealing with mobile forensics, no single forensic acquisition tool can obtain all of the da data on a phone or a digital device. And knowing that, if you're dealing with an analyst or expert or in any um, any field of digital evidence, they may have to use multiple tools in order to get all of the data from that particular device, especially if it's been deleted. A prime example of that would be with uh, Apple's iPhone or iOS devices. Uh, I remember a time before the iPhone 4S that we could get full physical images uh, or data dumps of, the, of any iOS device. Apple, uh, when they released the Apple iPhone 4S, that locked us out of those devices, of getting those, and has since then. Uh, there's techniques to get around that, but for the most part, uh, since the Apple iPhone 4, we haven't been able to get full data dumps from iPhones, uh, unless you're using some uh, vendor proprietary technique, which is not available to the general uh, scientific community and law enforcement. Uh, it's something that's really expensive and very proprietary. So knowing that your expert's going to use multiple tools, that may give you an understanding of what questions to ask when you're going through the litigation process. And to get necessary data, the examiner may have to turn to a variety of tools and processes in order to do that. So that could involve uh, maybe using a uh, a vendor tool, but also going in and extracting the chip from the phone, a process that we refer to as chip off or, or a, a JTAG process, which would go into, you know, using the uh, JTAG taps on a phone that's used to do firmware upgrades to, to extract that particular digital data from that phone. So even though you may have familiarity with many of those tools, and I know most of you probably do, uh, knowing why the examiner used that particular tool. Why did they bring that particular process in when they could have done something else? Or why did they use three different processes on the same piece of evidence? Did or they... why didn't they use a process? Exactly. Well, that exactly. was one question I wanted to ask you. Um, you most lawyers, I mean, we, we're not always that tech savvy, even though we're supposed to be ethically now, according to the ABA rules. Right. Um, but one of the things, is there like a list of every kind of a tool that's available to an examiner? 
Or is this something that people, uh, because it's a new science, area of forensic science, is it something that people are developing over time so there's no definitive like checklist of here's the kinds of tools that are available or do you kind of have to make it up as you go because you never saw this kind of a device before, for example? Unfortunately, no. There's no uh, standard database of all the tools that are being used. Now, a laboratory may have vetted tools that they have brought into uh, laboratory procedures that have been validated. So there are tools out there, for example, the uh, CFTT, the Computer Forensic Tool Testing Project uh, of NIST, test computer forensic tools and validate those, uh, even vendor tools. So for example, a write blocker device for a hard drive may have been vetted and tested by NIST uh, the CFTT project to say, okay, this does what it says it's going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is very hit or miss because there's vendor tools that pop up every day. Um, I can probably name uh, 10 vendor specific tools just for mobile phone analysis right now. Uh, that doesn't mean that all of those are invalid, but if a laboratory is using that tool, they should have validated that to make sure that it extracts the right kind of evidence. Now that can be a challenge because you know validation from laboratory to laboratory may be a completely different process um, if you start looking at their procedures. And so, I think when we when Mark talks too, we're probably going to talk about cold cases too. When we have things, and what do we do when when we need some old software and old um, computers or whatever exactly. devices are? So I know we'll we'll get into that when well, also you talk. Also, the other problem that Josh is pointing out is that. It's not just what the uh, extraction extracts, it's what it leaves behind, what it fails to extract. Right. And so you can have a tool that's been validated for extracting certain data, but leaves something behind which might make what you've extracted less significant. Right. And then on the other end of that, you're dealing with, uh, for example, if, if Microsoft decides tonight to encrypt every operating system that takes updates, and tomorrow morning we may be able to come in and not even access the hard drives as we were able to do before. Mm -hmm. Or the other end of the flip of that would be tomorrow there's a breakthrough from a vendor tool that allows us to bypass encryption. That can happen in the snap of a finger. That's not uh, something that's slow and evolving in some cases. If a vendor or a, a tool or an individual out there finds a workaround for it, that will eventually work its way into the forensic science community. That's just the evolving scientific standards. And the hacker community is acting in parallel, exactly. right. trying to do We're both. sometimes ahead. So, that's <laughs> well, they're, they're right. doing the same thing. They're trying to encrypt stuff and decrypt stuff at the same, at the same time. Right. Exactly. Many challenges. So. <laughs> Many challenges. Um, this is a, another, um, knowing the why the examiner used that tool is just as important as sometimes the process itself and understanding why they came to that conclusion. Another thing that you can do is get very granular with dealing with your experts and examiners. So be able to know and, and have the examiner be prepared to discuss why or what tool that they're using. So they should be able to get on the stand and to explain exactly what that tool is able to do, the, the capabilities of that, the capabilities that it's not able to do in some cases. And that could be even a process as well, like chip off, being able to explain that process from start to finish. Also, another thing to look at is have they been certified or trained to use those tools? This is a big problem in the digital evidence community because there's so many vendor level certifications out there and very few non-vendor certifications. So that's not a bad thing. Uh, with vendor level tools, for example, with mobile phones, uh, there are a lot of vendor level trainings that exist out there. So being able to identify if your examiner or expert has been through those trainings and is qualified to use that practice or that tool that they're doing. Also, another thing is how often do they test or validate those particular tools? Most labs, they'll set a, a validation standard where they'll test their tool every six months. I've been to laboratories where they test it every, every single case. They run it through a quick validation. So it really depends on the internal laboratory structure on how often they test and validate their tools. Things fail. Things go through updates. I've, even in my particular professional career, I've had things just not work for me. And knowing that that may be some kind of red flag in a case or being able to not extract data or data uh, corrupting could be an issue in many cases. 
Uh, so being able to understand why that validation has taken place quite a bit uh, or, right. or how often. And there's that rabbit hole about uh, not just testing and validating the tools, but testing and validating the tools that test and validate the tools. Exactly. Uh, and That's those correct. things rarely get tested, and so you have to be able to demonstrate it each time. So another thing is just simple chain of custody. Uh, in many cases, you're dealing with processes and procedures where we have to deconstruct the device. Um, I've had many cases where I've had to tear apart DVRs down to the absolute skeletal structure in some cases. And with phones, sometimes taking the chip off can be a very destructive procedure. So explaining why that was destructive. Uh, you know, we live in a world where forensic science, if we destroy the evidence, that's really a bad thing uh, in traditionally. But being able to explain why I had to take the chip off of that phone to read the data for it uh, and ultimately destroy that particular device. Um, we're trying to evolve standards and we're trying to evolve practices where we can put those phones back together into a working state. Uh, but that seems to be a work in progress from a lot of people that I talk to in the field. Also, where were these processes and these practices taken from? Were they taken from the scientific working group on digital evidence? Were they taken from the OSAC registry? Where are they getting these practices from? If they're using valid scientific practices, they should be able to explain where these came from. And if they can't, then you may be looking at a person that what we call cowboy forensics, where they just kind of fire from the hip and just do what they think should be the process, uh, which can sometimes have some pretty um, fatal endings in terms of getting evidence uh, to pass through uh, 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 the uh, discovery process in court. Yeah, you know, what's interesting, Josh, is the one thing you talked about documenting the process. There was just a case in Houston where the person was a um, digital uh, forensic exactly. examiner and destroyed notes um, that were made, the original notes, and was fired because of this and is being reported also to um, the uh, Texas Innocence Commission, yeah. too. So they take this very seriously. But I know in Texas because we just saw that happen in January. Yeah. So it's to keep the original notes and not destroy them. Well, original notes are really important. And in the case of Houston, one of the issues they ran in on, upon review was improper notes were taken at the scene when they were trying to seize a DVR. Mm -hmm. And I just mentioned, alluded to earlier, DVRs can be a challenge. So writing down what I call bench notes and, and take a note, okay, this is what I had to do with this DVR to extract the evidence from it. And what had happened was the examiner, uh, I actually read into this case, mm -hmm. where the examiner went back and upon review found that the extraction wasn't taken properly, so they had to go back to the scene. There wasn't enough bench notes that were taken by that examiner to reconstruct what happened the first time. So that was the big challenge in, at Houston because now you had a procedure that was done that we couldn't we couldn't go back and reconstruct again because the examiner didn't take notes properly so for even examiners out in the field this is kind of a warning challenge where take good notes because litigation may happen if not months and years down the road now whether those make make it into court is, is but having dependent. the notes is important exactly. because you can, uh, if the notes are destroyed, there's no way to say what was in those notes. So if you have, here's what happened, this is why I went back, did a new set of notes, but here's the originals is much better. Exactly. Right, the historic case report is not, always not enough. When you're dealing as, a, as an expert like I am, I take many, many case notes, not just for uh, litigation down the road, but for my own recollection, because there's been many cases I've testified years down the road, and I've forgotten even who the, the person on the case was, it, let alone you know just what I'm reading from the report. Mm -hmm. So uh, serial numbers from those devices, or there's been cases where it's came back through litigation before, and I've had to do an additional analysis on that. Mm -hmm. And remembering what I did the first time, uh, can sometimes be a challenge. And so also new notes. tools may have been developed exactly. in the interim. So, exactly, yeah. which is going to be something I'll allude to here on, with, with capital litigation uh, here in a couple of slides. So another thing to know is uh, the good examiner will document everything he or she did to do to recover and extract that data. Uh, it's a good narrative. It's something that, that good documentation, you'll know a good examiner by the, the notes that they take. You know that they've been through this before. Uh, the make, the model, the serial numbers, the software versions that they use on their software. Software, uh, for example, uh, different uh, forensic applications from version to version may extract different types of evidence or more evidence than the previous version. 
Uh, in cases where you want to document that discrepancy, you want to have the specific software version in the case report, not just in the case report, but in the bench notes as well. So if you have to go back and recreate that case, you can process it in that very same software version. So that's important. Now also the historical data in some of these notes may be valuable in older capital case litigation where data was not accessible during initial trial. And I know that with capital litigation, you're dealing with uh, appeals that may last years on end. And I know that with cell phone forensics, and mobile phone forensics, what we weren't able to get yesterday, we're able to get to today. So even upon appeal, if we had to go back and reanalyze that evidence, we may get more the second time around than we did the first time around. And that depends on your jurisdiction, too, because I know in Florida we can go ahead and supplement the record on appeal. Not every state will allow that, I think. Um, but that's one of the things that you can think about. Is as new things develop, that uh, you can go ahead and provide the court with yeah. more data. And of course, doing it the second time around raises the question of why you didn't do, do it, it the, the first, first time, time around. That's correct. And that, that raises a, a doubt in and of itself. And, and that's, a, that's, that's a good answer where you come around to say, okay, we have evolving scientific standards. We're getting better at what we're doing. And every day you look at the tools and you think, man, you know, that does so much better than it did 10 years ago. I can think of cases uh, from, from years ago where the limitations of the software just did not allow us to get around encryption. And I can look at those and say, man, you know, what, what would have happened if we used a tool from 2018 and process, process that against data from 2007 or a phone from 2007? And the problem you may have is the examiner who testified in 2007 said, we extracted all of the data from this phone. Uh, he extracted what he was able to, but right. he testified now under oath he extracted it all. And now 10 years later, you're saying, look at all the stuff we found that he wasn't able to extract. Mm -hmm. It's a good, good point made there because that, that is something with all the forensic science subdisciplines now, and digital evidence is no exception, but in digital evidence, this is, this is really uh, the outlier in this because data is just changing day by day, and uh, it's getting more complex, and it's getting more simplistic in certain cases, but uh, being able to extract that properly is a, is a key element in litigation, and being able to say, okay, did I get all of it, or did I get all that I was capable of getting at that time? With so the that, tool, right, that exactly, you have. Exactly. Now, also, uh, just advances in technology. A chip off didn't exist 10 years ago. It did, but we didn't use it in the forensic science lab environment. So. Uh, I know that's a, a hot new thing uh, in terms of bypassing encryption on Android devices. So we're able to take the chip off of the device, read it, and get a full physical read, even the deleted data from that phone. Now that's evolving. That, that's evolving in of itself. So there's best practices that are being published by the scientific working groups. Uh, I know that OSAC, we're, we're being challenged with looking at those procedures and publishing them to the registry. But I can tell you that that is an evolving thing that we're going to get better at over time. It's going to become more of a scientific procedure. Uh, so that's, those are just, that's, that's the nature of the scientific community. You know, we're trying to make, get better at what we do. Now, one of the things that, that we do uh, utilize is a scientific working group on digital evidence. Now, this is separate from the OSAC. Now, what the scientific working group on digital evidence does is that it brings together organizations that are actively engaged in the field of digital and multimedia evidence. Now, that fosters communication and cooperation as well to ensure the quality and consistency within the forensic science community. So you may have acad academics come in, you may have private sector. It's a very open organization. And, and the whole purpose of this organization is to develop and publish cross-disciplinary guidelines and standards for the recovery, preservation, and examination of digital evidence. So making sure that these examiners and experts are following at least a uniform procedure uh, or, or staying within the bounds of procedure in many cases. Uh, so say, for example, if they're doing a comparison of two videos, are they doing it properly? It's okay to say, I don't know, or it's inconclusive. It, you don't always have to come to this conclusion because you're being paid or on the stand as an expert, per se. So that's, a, that's an interesting token uh, that I even teach to my students back at Marshall. That is an acceptable answer. I don't know. And, and Josh, I think you bring up a really good point, and that is that forensics is nonpartisan. 
that right. that forensics is a science and that there shouldn't be secrets that defense lawyers use or prosecutors use or that cops use. These should be all out in the open because everybody benefits when the truth comes out. And so these idea of, of these nonpartisan and non biased agencies coming out and working together to develop standards is a great idea. And with SWIG, SWIG DE has been around quite a while mm -hmm. now. Um, and in fact, those standards are being looked at also, I imagine, by the OSAC subcommittees in order to say, should we continue with those particular standards that are in place already? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so words, some of these may then become adopted, I guess, or vetted and then adopted by the um, OSAC then. Right. So okay. the function of the, the OSAC subcommittee on digital evidence is we look at those documents that, that are put out by a scientific working group on digital evidence. We look at ISO standards. We look at ASTM standards. And we look at those and say, okay, does it meet all the criteria that NIST wants to publish that to the the registry it doesn't mean that the that the standard is defunct in many cases or it's not acceptable. It's just sometimes that we look at those and say, okay, this doesn't follow what we uh, we lay out to be uh, to go into the registry. And sometimes we've sent documents back to those organizations like ASTM to say, okay, this is these are the issues that we found in this document. So when those ASTM folks and SWIGDE folks meet, then they can address those particular concerns that we had at the OSAC level and then formulate and and put under another level of scrutiny those documents at the SWIGDE level. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of almost, I would refer to OSAC or the scientific area committees as being the judicial branch of government where you know we're looking at those and we're scrutinizing documents that were brought out by other committees that now that doesn't mean that because it's not ever getting published or doesn't get published that it's not a, a valid thing to use it's certainly not the case but it's just a, an extra layer of validation there to make sure that we're we're doing what we're, we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. okay now, also, SWIGDE also serves as a forum. If you go out to SWIGDE.org, uh, which is there in that slide, you can look and discuss and share and evaluate methods, training, and research to enhance the digital evidence field. For example, if you look at any of their best practices, they'll publish those for public comment. So I would highly encourage litigators to go out and look at those. And if you find any concerns, make public comments on those while they're out there because that helps us to evolve these particular best practices and come to a better consensus. Okay, this fits better in court. This fits better in litigation. Uh, because sometimes as scientists, we kind of get boxed in our own little scientific bubble uh, of thinking that things are right. Uh, but I've known when you approach it from across disciplinary and take it from different angles, you get a much better uh, document out there over time and you're able to extract much more evidence and have more sound evidence over time. And the, the OSAC also has a legal resource committee they do. as well they do. that can look and also provide data to you about what the courts might be concerned yeah, about. Yeah, so, so when we meet at the, the OSAC subcommittees, we have people from the LRC, the, the Legal Resource Committee, that comes in and we ask questions out of, you know, is this, would this be legally sound in a court of law? Or would this be something that would be questioned as far as evidence is concerned? So we have that, that kind of that added layer there that we can rely upon to get a legal perspective, of, which is amazing because, you know, sometimes, you know, you just don't look at it from that angle. And if you bring in a, you know, a prosecutor, or a defense attorney or a practicing attorney that can scrutinize that for you, uh, it's really been a helpful part of that process, in my opinion. Now, also to understand with OSAC, there is this OSAC registry. Now, if you go out and you look at the different subdisciplines, we have published um, on each of those particular subdisciplines documents that we vetted, but may not have made it to the official OSAC registry yet. So, what happens in the OSAC registry is we have these document vetting parts of the OSAC process that looks at those. And, uh, and, and determines whether that can be formally published to the OSAC registry. So that can be consensus standards, best practices, other guides. Now, for example, if we look out there and we don't have a standard or best practice that exists, the OSAC will look at formulating one themselves. And that's another part of the OSAC. Uh, but another thing with the OSAC registry is that that can be a lengthy, difficult process. In some cases, it may take a year just to turn around a document and then digital evidence, by the time we get something published to the registry, 
that may have changed. Mm-hmm. For example, magnetic card readers, SWIG DE published a standard or a best practice on it to deal with those gas pump skimmers. By the time that document got published, it was almost outdated because the skimmers had changed. So now we have to go back and look at that document again to reconfigure it say, to say, okay, how do we, you know, because some of this is just defunct now. It's not to being catch used. up with the technology. Exactly. Right? So sometimes documents may box you into something that you don't necessarily want to be boxed into, even from a legal perspective, because then that'll hamper your expert's ability to properly process that evidence and get it through uh, discovery and litigation. Now also, and this is one of the last things to mention, is that the existing standards that are in the OSAC registry doesn't mean that OSAC considers them invalid. So that's the importance of going out and looking at your vendor-specific documents that may be out there for facial recognition, speaker recognition, video and imaging technology, uh, going out and looking at what SWIG-DE has published, for example, uh, that's on record. Uh, Even going and looking at their internal validations that's being done per examiner. Those are all important things. So this is not a catch-all be-all at the OSAC registry to say, okay, because it's not here, I can't rely upon that expert's opinion. So going out and and referring to other documentation, but do know that if it does make it to the OSAC registry, it has been blessed by those subcommittees that are there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Thank All you. Right. Um, now we're going to turn to Mark, um, and uh, while we switch also some PowerPoint slides. Um, and, and Mark and I have known each other, I will tell you, um, for 30 years. We were talking about this earlier. Um, and that's one of the things that, uh, and Josh has helped us immensely with the kind of work we're doing, and so has Mark, um, with our in-person training. So we do, beyond just the webinars, we do in-person training conferences as well. And both Josh and Mark have spoken at those. Um, so we are really well-versed here with electronic evidence. Um, so what we'd like to do is... Um, Again, here, um, Mark is going to talk about the legal, I guess, aspect of this. And he is uh, well aware that there's many complexities in this entire area. Um, and, of course, it is constantly evolving, both from, I would say, the uh, scientific view as well as the legal view, that the, the law as it was, uh, say, a year ago is not the same as it is today or will be tomorrow. And I think that's one of the things. So uh, I think, Mark, now that we really are looking at this complex nature of this, um, maybe you can tell us a lot about the legal issues that the lawyers are going to face when they're confronted with this type of evidence. Sure. Thanks, Carl. And and the answer really is, you know, it's not just lawyers, it's lawyers and judges and, and the technology and the experts, because they, they don't speak the same language. That's number one. And the technology is changing so quickly that everybody is playing catch up. And it's not just the forensics technology that's changing so quickly, but the nature of technology itself, the kinds of devices that are out there, how they're being used, changes almost on a daily basis. And we really are playing catch up. And the reason why I call this this presentation about electronic evidence is not what you think, is because Josh just gave a wonderful presentation about how you forensically extract data from phones and devices. But now they're extracting it from the cloud. From, from other places where the person doing the extraction may be two or three levels beyond where you're getting the evidence. So I'll talk about where you get the evidence from and the like. So when we look at computer forensics first, we first have to get to the definition. It's very simple. It's the application of computer technology or forensic technology to the, to the presentation of evidence in court. So very simply, whenever you take anything, whether this, it's this piece of paper with printouts from this PowerPoint or not, this is electronic evidence because this was originally created electronically and digitally printed, and it has to be validated and verified. So the other reason why forensic evidence is not what you think is forensic digital evidence is going to be important in every single case that anybody does. Anytime you have a document, every time you have something that was created, every time you have a photograph, an image, anything, you're going to have some degree of digital forensics that you're going to be required to to deal with. So forensic evidence uh, is uh, forensic evidence and digital evidence is everywhere, and it's used to establish the facts and to establish that you have to establish that the forensic examiner is not biased, and that's what we were talking about earlier. There are no secrets here. The the most important thing here is to be able to have everybody on the same page and everybody essentially talking about the same science. And then we talk about the electronic crime scene. 
Now, we're used to using forensic evidence and digital evidence in computer crime cases, but in almost every kind of case, you're going to have digital evidence. For example, in the Trayvon Martin case, they seized Trayvon Martin's phone, and in his phone, they printed out over 900 pages of text messages, images, metadata, and the like. Uh, so not only that, but even if there's no digital evidence being presented by the prosecutor in the case, the defense counsel can look and say, what is the digital evidence that's out there that I might be able to find, that I might be able to present? So even in a, in a murder case, you're going to say, are there digital cameras out there? Are there traffic cameras out there? Is there a GPS device that might be able to demonstrate an alibi or some variation uh, that'll be relevant in the case? So we think about digital evidence when we think about computer files and records, but it's much broader than that. And as we start moving into the Internet of Things, where devices themselves that are worn or that are carried are creating records, we're going to have to be able to extract and present the evidence from those as well. So when we look at uh, things like printouts, magazines, uh, evidence from a watch, anything like that, it, it mostly cre created uh, in a little digital format. The only exception is handwritten notes. Everything else is going to probably be created in a digital format. So even physical evidence like surveillance videos or crime scene photographs or radar or LIDAR or everything like that, the measurements of those are going to be done digitally. So when you have a police officer testifying in court that somebody that the, the radar showed that the person was driving at some speed or the LIDAR showed it, all of that is a digital signal processing. And that has to be validated as well. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is a measurement and what is a digital record for evidentiary purposes? And these are things that are not well understood. So for example, if you look at log data, who, who logged into my computer, the question is, is an IP address a measurement of something, or is an IP address some physical attribute of that thing? And the answer, by and large, is we don't know. Mm -hmm. We take shortcuts, but we don't know the answer to those questions. So one of the things we also talk about, we talk about this forensics as being able to extract data from a device. And it's rarely coming from a computer anymore. The old days was you would have the, the police would come in, they would seize a bunch of desktop machines, they would forensically image these hard drives, they would extract data from the hard drives, they would process it and present that evidence in court. Most of the evidence is not coming in that way anymore. It's coming from the cloud, it's coming from Google, it's coming from Facebook, it's coming from social media, it's coming from surveillance cameras, things that are one step removed from the kind of devices we were thinking about. So the phone is in the computer, the network uh, is it. third parties, and I'll talk about that in a minute, how, how important and how much we rely on third parties, plus the data is international. Mm -hmm. And the question then becomes, how do we get evidence that is stored uh, or processed from a third party who may be in Bulgaria or San Juan uh, or in uh, uh, San Paolo? And how do we deal with data that is in all three locations at the same time? So these were the takeaways for 1986, all right? One of the problems you have is, as you were talking about, Carol, is cold cases. So you may find digital evidence and digital forensics from cases that date back 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And by and large, we don't really have the forensics tools to mount an old uh, um, VAX computer and get data from that. So one of the things you have to remember is, you be, one of the things you have to be able to do is go back and look for who has those forensics tools. Who can go back and read an eight inch floppy drive and have the software that will be able to read it, and we'll be able to do it in a forensic manner. And actually, NIST is assembling sort of, I would say, a graveyard of yeah. these kinds of tools. Um, and I know the American Academy of Forensic Sciences also had a committee that said, we need to look into this, because if we have all these cold cases, what we need to do is let's go ahead and get the tools so we can revisit these things with some new tools, but a lot of times you can't read the data, or you just say you have a problem. So that is being worked on, but yes, that has been a very real issue. And, it, and it's not just a matter of having the tools, it's a matter of even being able to have the hardware and the software, software. to run the devices first, right. and then have the tools to extract data from those devices as well. So all of those are problems for doing forensics on cold cases, particularly a problem when the forensics is 
for the defense because we, we're used to prosecutors being able to go up to NIST and being able to go up there and have forensic examination to get evidence to prove their case. But we also need to be able to have the same capabilities that defense Events. counsel can use and in civil litigation as well. This is multi-million, multi-billion dollar litigation and they need to have the ability to present their cases. Mm -hmm. So that's a real problem there. So basically you've got to consider that every case is going to have forensic evidence. One of the issues that the Supreme Court is dealing with this term is the uh, admissibility and ability to obtain what are called cell tower dumps. So cell towers now have the ability to capture information about every phone that is within range of that tower. So if you want to know where somebody is, their, their physical location, typically you're going to use a tower dump to do that. And it can be one, done in one of two ways. You can give them a phone number and say, tell me every place this phone number, a person using this phone has been. Or the other way is you say you have a homicide in a particular location at two o'clock in the morning, you can say, tell me every cell phone that was at that location near that homicide. And the problem is the phone companies are keeping these records. Uh, they don't keep them for a very long time. That's what I was going to ask. How long do they keep the records? It varies from company to company. Uh, what, what governments want is for them to keep them a very long time so that they can establish uh, a forensic trail. But even if they don't keep them, the government can create this kind of record on their own using devices like what's called the Stingray, where they mm -hmm. simply capture evidence from your phone itself. So that will tell you location, it will tell you calling data, who they called, how long they called, and all this kind of information. And what the court is trying to decide this term is whether or not they need a search warrant to be able to do that. Can't the Stingray also like pretend it's a tower? That's what the Stingray does. That's what I was going to say. The okay. Stingray acts as the tower, so while you think you're connecting to, to AT&T right. or Verizon, you're actually connecting to a government-owned device. And it's collecting data on everybody in that device. And there's another one called, euphemistically called Dirtbag, because it's <laughs> DRT, are the, are the, uh, the, the numbers for it. And those are done in, in a plane. And you fly a plane around, and you capture all the records for an entire city. Mm -hmm. So those are all privacy concerns, but they're also forensics concerns as well. Mm -hmm. So if you capture data from a cell tower, how do you forensically present that into court? Uh, the other thing is we have uh, a tremendous amount of information that we get through surveillance, and that includes traffic cameras, so the cell tower dumps I was talking about before, but digital traffic cameras. We have uh, tolls, uh, easy pass records and the like, facial recognition. If you walk around uh, through the streets of London, for example, you're going to be captured probably every 20 feet through an, on another camera. And these cameras are all high definition cameras that do facial recognition. So you can literally take the name of a person and say, tell me every place that they have been. Or take an image and say, where were they for the last two days, three days, three weeks, three months. Uh, and social media as well. Uh, Josh was talking earlier about comparing databases of facial recognition. We typically think about comparing databases of facial rec recognition as comparing DMV records against, uh, against surveillance videos, against um, arrest photographs. But if you want to get the largest database of faces uh, and images, you look at social media, mm -hmm. like Facebook. And one of the questions is, if I have a picture of a suspect, and I use facial recognition software, can I now run that against Facebook and say, who is this person? Or who matches this person? Or not even that person, but was that person in a photograph that somebody on Facebook once took and find out who they were and what pictures they have and who their friends are? So from a privacy standpoint, uh, it's a tremendous challenge. But also from a forensic standpoint, how do we present that? You can do Google imaging too, right? If you do a Google image, you can look for photos that you didn't even know were taken. There are various ways to do, to do Google images. So mm -hmm. for example, you can take an image yourself and you can put it onto Google images and say, tell me everywhere on the web that this, this particular identical image appears. But it will also use fuzzy logic and it'll say, tell me where images like this appear as well. Mm -hmm. so. so, you know, this I call woke up, got out of bed, dragged the comb across my head. When you wake up in the morning, if you are woken by your phone as an alarm clock, there's a digital record that your alarm went off. 
There's a digital record that you turned on the television set. There's a digital record what radio station you listen to if you're listening through uh, uh, your phone. Uh, if you watch TV online, it knows what television show you're watching, where you paused, where you continued, where you physically were when you did it. So what's happening is we live in really the golden age of surveillance. And as difficult as it is, as Josh was talking about sometimes, to get data because it is encrypted, there is so much more data about what people do on a day-to-day -day basis that the amount of data that we're able to retrieve about people is thousands of times more than the amount of data they're able to conceal through encryption. Encryption is, by and large right now, a voluntary process. Mm -hmm. There are phones and computers that will encrypt by default, but by and large you have to decide that you want to encrypt data. Whereas all of these digital breadcrumbs that are created about you are created sometimes without your knowledge mm -hmm. and sometimes in a way that's not, not encrypted. So, while we're concerned about what the FBI calls the going dark problem, uh, there's so much data about people. So when you look at somebody like, like an iPhone and you say, I can't get to that iPhone because it is encrypted. And since the iPhone 4, there have been various layers of encryption built into the iPhone. Almost everything that's on that iPhone came from somewhere else. Uh, every text message, every video, every song, every uh, email, came from somewhere else and can be re reconstructed from somewhere else. The exceptions are going to be photographs that you take that you haven't shared with anybody, and that's about it. So while we worry about this idea of not being able to get to somebody's phone, we can get to the data through other means. And in fact, if you have an iPhone and you've synced that iPhone with your computer, mm -hmm. Unless you've also encrypted your computer, you can get off the computer. And if you synced it with the cloud, you can get off of the cloud. Um, Josh already alluded to the issue about primary and metadata. Uh, primary data might be a photograph that you might find on a, on a computer, on an iPhone, or a device. And one of the issues that, that uh, we haven't really addressed is how much of the data is on the web itself. So if you have an image on a website. How do you authenticate that image on a website? Mm -hmm. We have all of these tools for forensic extraction from a computer. But when you get to a website, you've transferred that image from wherever it's located to your own computer already using HTTP, a hypertext transfer protocol. By the time you get that, you have a copy of the image that was on the website, which now you have to authenticate. Now, there's a certain amount of data you might be able to find on that and a certain amount of forensics you might be able to do, but it's not the original. So often we get the original through a subpoena or a search warrant, but there the forensics are done by the person who, who was compelled to produce the records. And there's no forensics on that. They simply produce the records. And then you may compel them to produce a custodian of records, but that's not the same thing as forensic data. Right, which is interesting, Mark, because I, I was doing some research and they have here an article what every judge and lawyer needs to know about electronic evidence on authentication, which will be in our um, bibliography of information by uh, Gregory Joseph. But that is one of the issues is that we have to think of what you know we do whether we're under the federal rules of evidence or under our state rules of how do we get this information into court. First, we want to get the information, but then how do we actually get it into court and before the judge and the jury? So the three... The the big problems you have is, where is the information located and how do I get it? Um, then once I've got it, how do I prove that it is what it, it purports is. to be mm -hmm. and hasn't been modified or altered in any way? And then the third one is, how do I actually admit it into evidence? So it, it's uh, identification, extraction, and presentation. And those are all uh, different things and they're all difficult to do. They, at, at their core, they're very simple. This is the image that I found on this web page. But if you need to be able to demonstrate what the image is of or who took it, and so Josh already talked about the idea that you can manipulate images. Mm -hmm. Through forensics, you can demonstrate for the time being that the image was manipulated. But you may not be able to tell what was the original image. And the other thing, you know, uh, you know we, we're talking about this idea that they have these pornographic images of movie stars where they, they morph the movie star's face onto the image, uh, the pornographic image of someone else. 
Equally bad is where they have what's called virtual child pornography, mm -hmm. where they have either the image of a, uh, a child with an adult's face on it or the other way around. And the problem with the other way around is where the pornographic part of the image is an adult or somebody who's just barely legal and the face is that of a minor is that there was no actual child pornography and the child pornography laws deal with the fact that the creation of child pornography was a form of child abuse and yet now floating around on the internet are images that appear to be you know your 15 year old daughter performing sex acts so the harm occurs to the the minor whether or not they ever created child pornography or not mm -hmm. and the law has not kept pace with this so in ACLU versus Reno, this is going back in, in 1984, the Supreme Court said that child pornography has to have an actual child making a pornographic image. But now we're at the point where the pornographic image has an actual child's head, but they never performed the pornography. And the question is, is that constitutionally protected free speech mm -hmm. or is it illegal? Mm -hmm. The other part of it is when the police introduce child pornography into court, they have to demonstrate that it is, in fact, a pornographic image of an actual child. And that's becoming much more difficult to do with the ability to manipulate images, mm -hmm. especially when they download it off the web. You know, when you, when, what they use right now is what's called an MD5 hash function. And with MD5 hash, they take a known image of known child pornography that they have validated, and they essentially digitally sign it. So what they do is they scan the internet for anything that has that same image. Same image, same file, therefore it's been and then validated. Trace it, right. right. The problem now is there are many ways to defeat MD5 hash functions. The first one is if you change one pixel, you've now changed the entire image for those purposes. And so being able to demonstrate that something is what it purports to be digitally is much more difficult than it is, uh, you know, in an analog environment. Mm -hmm. Mark brings up a good point with authentication of sources where we've seen cases like the Boston bombing where we had videos where people had caught the bombers in action and didn't realize they had caught them and posted them to YouTube or, or turned them over to the police. And the police has this evidence now that they can't technically authenticate the source of who took the video. Mm -hmm. So that could be a challenge when bringing evidence into court. Who posted this particular video to YouTube or Facebook or Twitter? And how do we get in touch with that person who posted it? In many cases, you can't. But now you have a, a video that's been posted. You know that it's that it could potentially be valid evidence. But now it's hard to get into court because you can't yeah, authenticate right. source. And, and you know what's funny is a lot of this is, is just makes it hard but not fatal. And that's what's really interesting is we make this much more complicated in many cases than we need to because in that in that case we have a video image posted to facebook or youtube or whatever uh that looks like an image of the boston bombing and we want to get this into court because say oh look i can see this one bomber putting the bag down i captured it but i don't know who created the image and as you know you know you can try to go back and say well it was taken with an iphone 4 and it was taken uh, at the location but the truth is anybody looking at that video is gonna say, I know what that is. That's an image of the Boston bombing case. Why? Because I recognize Boylston Street. Mm -hmm. I recognize the images of the individuals from other images. On the other hand, we had that movie that came out about the Boston bombing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you were to look at those images, you say, oh yes, that's an image of the Boston bombing, which it wasn't, it was a recreation. Creation. So the real question is, even if you don't know the provenance of an image or a device that says, can I, is, am I reasonably assured that it is what it purports to be? And a lot of this will go to weight rather than to admissibility. And one of the things that courts and judges and, and experts have to struggle with is the idea of, I don't know the provenance of this, but it looks like this and I have no reason to believe it's been manipulated. So there you're trying to prove a negative. You're not trying to prove that it is an image of the Boston bombing, but you're trying to prove that it was not a recreation of the Boston bombing. Again, looking at, is it valid, you know? Is, and well, you're going to compare the image and the lighting against other images that you can validate. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, you know, typically, you know, when you have a photograph of a crime scene, you're going to say, you can have somebody, the photographer there, and you can talk about the F-stops, and you can talk about the lighting and all that stuff. Or you can say, were you at the crime scene? Yes, I was. 
I'm going to show you this picture. What's that? That's the crime scene. Person knows nothing at all about photography or forensics, but they can authenticate the, the, uh, the image. So anybody who was there might be able to say, look, I don't know where that image came from, but I viewed it, and that's what I remember it to look like. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, we, we demand a degree of authentication and scientific certainty for, for things that are digital that we don't demand for analog records. And an example would be a memorandum. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I were to take a paper memorandum of 1950 and hand it to somebody, we are not going to have an expert on typewriters and type ribbons unless there's a challenge to the authenticity. authenticity. We're going to hand it to the person and say, did you write a memo? He says, yes. I show you this exhibit. Is this the memo you wrote? He says, yes. It's admissible. But when, how did you recognize yeah, it? How do you recognize it? Because right. I wrote the memo. Right. And that's it. And you're done. Three questions and it's admissible. Now in the electronic age, what, what word processor did you use? What version of Word did you use? Where did you store it? Did you store it on the cloud? What kind of security did you have? And part of the reason is because the memo itself can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I see it and I recognize it doesn't mean it's the same one that I wrote. So things like information security, access control, uh, authentication, MD5 hash functions all become important even in very simple cases. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is about metadata. Metadata is data about data. So if I have a file, like uh, an image that I downloaded off the internet, you may then want to be able to demonstrate where it is, when was it created, when was it stored, who had access to it, who changed it, who modified it. That's great when you start moving over to the cloud. If I create a document on Google Docs, there may be dozens of people with access to it. And now I have to get all of that data from Google about who accessed it and the like. So one of the other problems is when you seize records, you have to make sure that you're not just seizing the records, but you're seizing the metadata about the records. And that's especially true when the records are held by third parties. So we talked about the cell tower dump. You're going to go to AT&T or Verizon and say, I want the cell tower records. But you also want the records of how were the cell tower records created, what software was used to create the cell tower, what version of the software was used. If you don't ask for it, you're not going to have it. You may not be able to present the records then. Okay. Mark brings up a good point here, too, with metadata in terms of when a photo is uploaded to Facebook, for example, the metadata is stripped out of that photograph when it's presented to the public. So if someone's doing open source intelligence and pulls that data offline, expecting to see certain exif metadata in that picture, they may not see it. But the custodian of records, Facebook, may have that original right. metadata when asking for those records. So just because it's not there as it's posted in the cloud doesn't mean that it was totally stripped out to begin with because, or after it was uploaded, because we've asked for records before and have been able to see some of the original metadata in those photographs when we've asked for that data from those custodian and records. And that happens with documents too of lawyers, of course, like when we're sitting there editing documents and right. everything. And what they say, you know, if you then produce this in, say, discovery or something, have you stripped it of the metadata? Otherwise, people can see all the different iterations of your document. Yeah. Um, and, and that's that true. Previous. You know, and when you when you bill a client, uh, you know, uh, for four hours of work, and they see that all you did is a global search and replace from an old document, yeah. that can be important as well. I would think so. We're going to talk about ethics a little bit later that's right. too. Okay. But there's a, there's also an ethical component to this as well, and that is to make sure that what you're presenting is what it purports to, to be, be. Uh, to a reasonable degree of certainty. And, and what Josh was pointing out is a lot of what we're talking about in forensics is really about asking for the right stuff mm -hmm. and drafting the subpoena or search warrant in a way that calls for the forensic production of forensically relevant information. And you have to remember that this stuff is very ephemeral. And so what happens is the, the records of a cell phone call or, or of a text message may exist only for a few days. So you want to get a preservation order in mm -hmm. place and immediately uh, and then figure out what it is that you need. Because you, you, if you don't ask for it, it won't it won't be produced. But or it are, won't be also preserved. That's the other thing. It won't be thing, preserved. Right? And and the thing is, we are really moving from an era of physical forensic on physical devices to demanding production of records from third parties. And that trend is going to continue to accelerate. It doesn't mean we can't do a lot of forensics on the devices themselves or on the data. But mm -hmm. by and large, the data is being produced by a third party pursuant to a subpoena or search warrant. Right. So. 
one of the problems you have uh, is with, with data and, and metadata. So data would be the contents of an email, the contents of a document, uh, the contents of a communication. But the metadata would be where was the person when they created the document? What computer were they using? What version of the software were they using? Deleted data, restored data, modified data, uh, encrypted data, all of that requires a subpoena and, and analysis of metadata. Uh, so the other question is, how do you get it from a third party? And that's a real a, a practical concern about getting data from a third party. By and large, to get data from a third party, whether it's a phone company or Google or something like that, you have to have legal process. So you're gonna to need to have a subpoena or a search warrant. There are a few exceptions. One, uh, the owner of the data can give consent. They can say, yes, it's okay if you have the data. Uh, you can get an express waiver or an implied waiver. Um, and then occasionally, uh, the uh, providers will provide data if there's an exigent circumstance, even without a warrant. So for example, if there's an imminent threat to public health and safety, they may be willing to provide data if you get the warrant after the fact. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the clear cases, and this is this is what we're dealing with uh, in the law, is the fact that we have a legacy of case law that dates back to the 18th century, and we're trying to deal with that when we deal with 21st century uh, science and technology. So one of the things that happened in early on was we have the Fourth Amendment search and seizure, and that deals with literally physically searching for and seizing something. So one of the early cases in the 1920s was a case called Olmstead, and the Supreme Court had to deal with the question of whether when you listen in on a phone call, are you searching for or seizing anything? And the Supreme Court said, no, you're not seizing anything, you're just listening to a phone call. And we had to create a whole new body of privacy law <clears throat> to deal with that problem. Well, there was a case in the, in the, in the 1970s called Smith versus Maryland, where uh, a woman had her purse stolen in Baltimore, and the person who had her uh, purse got her phone number and her address. And he started calling her phone, this landline phone, and making harassing phone calls and driving by her apartment. And she got the license plate number, and she called the police. And the police had this suspect named Smith. And they went to the phone company with a subpoena and subpoenaed Smith's phone records mm -hmm. and showed, sure enough, he was the one making the phone calls. No problem. But the question was, who owns those phone records? And does Mr. Smith have any expectation of privacy in the phone calls? And the Supreme Court said, first of all, they're the phone company's records. They don't belong to Smith. Smith voluntarily trusted those records with a third party, the phone company. And he knew at the time that he called, made a phone call, that those records were being created and were available. And therefore, for three different reasons, he had no privacy in records held by a third party. Like when you put things on your Facebook page. Like when, so, right. But that's so, different. Yeah. When you put something on your Facebook page, you are actually making a decision to expose that to the public. Mm -hmm. When you walk around downtown St. Petersburg with a phone in your pocket, not doing anything, are you voluntarily exposing your, your, your location? Your whereabouts, right. All right? And if you're wearing a smartwatch or if you're wearing a Fitbit, are you voluntarily exposing <clears throat> your pulse, your respirations, your, whether, whether you're breathing, all of that, to the public? Mm -hmm. And the answer is we don't know. So we have the legacy of the Smith case applied to 21st century technology right. where everything you do creates a record on a third party. And so now we have questions about... Can the government subpoena GPS data from, from the phone company? Can they subpoena GPS data from Fitbit, from Google? You know, if you go back to Google Maps, mm -hmm. you can go back to Google Maps on your own and say, see every place that you have been for the last five years. And so the question is, who has access to those kinds of records? And how do we retrieve those records and present them in a forensic manner? Okay. So that's one of the problems that we have is Smith. United States versus Miller dealt with bank records, all right? And, then, and there's, the question is, we used to have a distinction between records about us. So, like, so our bank records are actually not our records. They're the bank's records of how we use the bank. The phone records are not actually our records. It's the phone company's records of how we use the phone company. But you get to something like Google Drive, 
These are your records. And lawyers and law firms keep their records on cloud-based mm -hmm. uh, devices. Uh, they back them up to cloud-based devices or they store them there. And if unless those files are encrypted, the government can subpoena them or somebody else can subpoena them, and you may never know that they've been subpoenaed. And you have no way of, of claiming attorney-client privilege because you don't know that they've been obtained. So the third-party doctrine and the third-party storage is a huge problem for both forensics, privacy, and the obtaining of records. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we talk about metadata and privacy, in the Jones case in the Supreme Court uh, a few years ago, uh, the government put a physical tracking device onto Mr. Jones' uh, phone, uh, his car. And they got a warrant to do it, but the warrant had expired. And so they had a 30-day warrant, and they put it on on the 32nd day. And they put it on. The court ruled that the placing of the device onto the car was without a warrant. And so they ruled that the placing of it without a warrant uh, was illegal because of the property interest in the car. Nothing to do with privacy. So what the government did afterwards is they subpoenaed from the phone company Jones's cell phone tracking records and reconvicted him the same way. Uh, so one of the big issues we have to decide is what is the legal level of legal process, both for prosecutors and defense counsel and in civil litigation, for obtaining intimate personal details about people, their diaries, their records, their notes, and do we have to even give them notice if we're getting it from a third party? So we're dealing with all that kind of issue as well. Um, when we talk about data about data, there's a whole bunch of data that you can learn about data, not just information about the sender, what browser type they're using, what version of the browser they're using, what operating system they're using, what ecosystem that they're using. So what's really interesting is, even if you don't think that you're giving out personal data when you go online, you may have 20 or 30 or 40 apps on your phone or on your device, on your computer. Each one has its own version. So by knowing what apps you have and what version it is, they, they can narrow down just looking at the browser that, that you are who you were at that particular time just based on the browser. They can trace packets across the network. Uh, you, can, you can trace location through different kinds of uh, techniques. So all of these are ways to track back uh, bad guys, access logs, and things like that. When you're looking at devices and you're looking at where you're going to get the data from, you have to start with hardware devices, the phones, uh, the computers, the laptops, the desktops, the iPods, the tablets, and, the, and all of those. And those you're going to use standard forensic collection techniques to obtain. But you also want to look at network resources, third-party resources, and now IoT, Internet of mm -hmm. Things devices. <clears throat> so you can now extract data from a Nest thermostat. You can extract data from an IoT, Internet-connected camera, from a Fitbit or an, I, I, uh, an Apple Watch. From an Alexa, right? From, a, from Alexa. There was a case uh, recently <coughs> where uh, it was a murder case in California, uh, no, I'm sorry, in, was it in Washington? No, in Arkansas. A murder case in Arkansas where the government believed that during the course of the murder, somebody's Alexa device was turned on. And therefore, they subpoenaed from Amazon in Seattle the records related to this person's Alexa device because they're always on listening for what they call the wake-up word. Mm -hmm. and they capture little bits of data. But even if they don't do that, the fact that you've used Alexa proves that you are home. Mm -hmm. And so even little bits of data like that can prove not only that you're home, but you're within range of the machine so that you're in the bedroom and not the living room or vice versa. All of that can be used forensically as well. So we have a tremendous amount of data that you can get about people. Um, the other problem is that data is located anywhere in the world. Uh, your ISP may store your data in other locations. There's a case pending right now in the Supreme Court. It's going to be argued in about a month that deals with Microsoft storing emails in Dublin, Ireland. And the question is whether or not U.S. courts can compel Microsoft, which is a U.S. company, to produce emails of European citizens uh, uh, emailing themselves because they're stored in Dublin but by a U.S. company. So... 
uh, you want to recreate the digital footprint, you want to be able to preserve the records and then get them later. But think globally about where that data might be and where you're going to get it from. Search warrants, you have to have specificity. Now, one of the big problems you have with a search warrant is the old days used to be when you want to get forensic evidence, you or a regular evidence, you get a search warrant saying, I want the murder weapon, I want the knife. You would uh, tell them what you wanted, tell them where you expected it to be, establish probable cause, search for it, and then seize it. That's not how you do it with electronic evidence. Electronic evidence is the person sent, uh, has child, downloaded child porn. They have computers at their house. I'm not sure which computer downloaded it, but one of the computers there did. So you get a search warrant for all computers in the house. Then you search every computer to see if it has child porn. And if it does, then you seize that computer. But actually what you do is you go in, you search every computer, you seize every computer, and then you search later. So it used to be search and seizure. Now it's seizure and search. Mm -hmm. And that raises all kinds of privacy rights because the Fourth Amendment, of course, requires that the warrant specifically, specifically. identify the thing to be seized. And it's no longer sufficient to, sufficient to specifically identify the thing to be seized is a Dell computer because now you're seizing every file, every record, every email, every communication, stuff that has nothing at all to do with the investigation. So now what you do is <clears throat> the specificity is done by establishing the procedure that you're going to use forensically for examining the files. So it's no longer search and seize with specificity. It sees everything and then conduct forensic investigation with specificity. Mm -hmm. So the other problem is we don't know what constitutes a search or a seizure electronically. We don't know where the search is conducted. So for example, if you have... Uh, uh, records located outside the United States. Where is that search being conducted? Where do you get a warrant to conduct a search on, say, a botnet located in Russia? And whose law applies and whose privacy law? Uh, so you have to define the scope of the search, the scope of the seizure, how you do this on a cloud provider, and its impact. Yes, can laws. you partition the cloud? This is what I was thinking too. That, that's another question, isn't it? The part, yeah, the answer is yes, you do, but it's an artificial partition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you do is you say, this is my part of the cloud. But the truth is, it's just sitting on some server. So from a legal standpoint, yes. From a forensic standpoint, no. From a forensic standpoint, it's a server with everybody's data on it. From a so legal standpoint. So you know it's not too broad, like we need to go back and think of old pen registers and that, okay, That's now right. don't listen to this conversation because that has nothing to do with the scope of what we need. Um, this is another What's funny is in, in the old days, you, you did minimization by, you'd listen to a phone call and if they stopped talking about what you were interested in, you had to turn the machine off. Right. And then you could turn it on occasionally. But here you don't sure. turn off the cloud. Here you I mean, capture everything. Yeah. And your minimization is done by the, the key words and phrases that you're searching for. So you have this sort of electronic search. One of the questions that's really uh, not been addressed yet is, if you are allowed to see, say, all of my emails that are traveling across a network, you're actually examining every email of everybody's across the network and then seizing only mine. Mm -hmm. Does that comport with minimization when you're reading maybe the emails of hundreds of thousands of people just to find mine? When a bot conducts a search, is that a search? And the answer is we don't know. Mm. So these are all the issues that we're dealing with when we deal with search warrants. The other problem is what I call a Franken warrant under the Stored Communications Act. If I want to get your Google Mail, your Gmail, I don't go to Google in California, kick in the door, hand them a search warrant, and seize records. What I do is I have to get a search warrant because you have an expectation of privacy in the contents of your email. And the courts have ruled that in order to get the contents of email, I have to get a search warrant, not a simple subpoena. Now, a search warrant is a warrant to a police officer saying, you are authorized to go search and seize. And we know it's a search warrant because somebody kicks in your door. Well, under the Stored Communications Act, that's not how it works. I get a search warrant, and I fax that to Google. So the question then becomes, who does the search? Mm -hmm. Who's conducting the search? The search warrant says to any authorized law enforcement official, and so in the case in Arkansas, 
they got a search warrant by a magistrate in Arkansas that they faxed to a judge, I mean, to, to a, a target in California. Well, there's no way that an Arkansas cop could fly to California and demand production of records. So we have all this question about jurisdiction and venue, and all of that is unresolved, not to mention the forensics part of this. So the other thing that's happening increasingly is they're getting gag orders. Uh, and so what will happen is you will have the entire contents of your law firm seized and searched by police officers, and they will, have a, they will get a gag order issued to your provider. So you will never know that it happened. But is there a way around that, Mark? Well, there is. It's funny that you should ask. The only way really around the gag order is what's called a canary. So what you do is you say to your provider where you're storing your records, um, I want you to certify once a month that you have not produced my records to anybody. And so every month goes by, January comes by, they certify, I haven't produced your records. February, I haven't produced your records. March, I haven't produced your records. April, no certification. The fact that they cannot certify under oath that they haven't produced your records to somebody is effectively the canary that tells you there's some record, problem in the coal mine. That's a, there's a problem in the coal mine. For West Virginia. <laughs> hey, right, for West Virginia. Virginia. Exactly. exactly. No, but, that's, but do, will they all comply with this? I mean, Well, the problem seems? is this. So, so in, if I was uh, a law enforcement agency uh, and I went to Google and I said, all right, I want this guy's records and you can't tell anybody about it. And Google comes back and says, okay, what do I do next month when I have to certify that I haven't, oh, under oath, uh, that I haven't And what's my liability? Right. I mean, that's right. So they, they're going to have to get a court order, have a court order Google or somebody to, to commit to lie and to falsely certify. Mm -hmm. All right. And in balancing of the equities, the court may, be, may say, look, I'm going to order that they, that they not affirmatively tell them, but I'm not going to affirmatively order them to lie. So, you know, they, they might. You, I can imagine circumstances in an intelligence well, situation. Well, maybe national security. In a national security right. situation or an imminent harm. But the presumption in a search warrant is that it's known. It is very rare to get a, 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 a no-knock warrant where you can go in, seize what you want, and not tell the person. Mm -hmm. You leave a copy of the warrant with, with the person who's done the search. Now that we have a disconnect between where the search is conducted and where the person has a privacy interest. There was a case recently involving Facebook where the, where the law enforcement in New York suspected first responders on 9-11 of committing um, disability fraud. Mm -hmm. So they went to Facebook and they got 381 identical search warrants for firefighters, police, other law enforcement, so they could examine their Facebook pages, pictures of them skiing, pictures of them with their kids, and say, aha, see, you claim to be totally disabled, and yet we have these pictures. They got an order in every single one of those cases saying that you can't tell the suspect. Now, I can't imagine that every one of those 381 people who are police and firefighters were likely to flee. I can't imagine that all 381 of them were likely to destroy evidence that the government had already seized. And yet a court ordered in every single one of those cases that the evidence Would be, be. be ga a gag order. And it's a permanent gag order. Mm. So the only way you could tell that the government had seized it is if you got prosecuted. If you never got prosecuted, you would never know that the government had been monitoring your Facebook page. Mm. And that's the new normal. All right. That's what's happening now. <clears throat> so that's the, the Facebook page, and, I, and, and you have a citation to it as well. But not only do they order them to retrieve it, they order them to retrieve everything in the Facebook page, every tweet, every direct message, every posting, and everything like that. And all of it was sorted, every deleted message. Stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with whether or not that person was disabled ended up being seized, and people don't know that it's been done. Mm. The, the court in the Facebook case said that when Facebook moved to quash the subpoena, the search warrant, they said Facebook couldn't quash the search warrant because there's no procedure for quashing a search warrant. Why? Because you never quash a search warrant. You only find out that there's a search warrant when somebody kicks in the door. So we have this hybrid between a subpoena and a search warrant. We treat it one way for one and one way for another. Mm. All right. So uh, we talk about gag orders and non-disclosure. <laughs> These are becoming very frequent now. Now, 
The standard for a gag order has always been that you have to demonstrate that there's a likelihood that if the defendant knew about this investigation and knew these records were seized, they would either flee the jurisdiction, threaten or ha harass, intimidate witnesses, or destroy evidence. That was the standard. Now the new standard is it might hinder my investigation. It's always easier for the police to conduct an investigation if the target doesn't know that they're investigating. But when you're doing things like searching their books and records, their tax returns, their, their intimate records, they have a right to know. And we haven't caught up with that. In some jurisdictions, even a subpoena is automatically uh, with a gag order. So, for example, in Minnesota, an administrative subpoena comes with a statutory gag order. If you get a subpoena in Minnesota, you are not allowed to tell somebody that you got the subpoena. So as a lawyer, if you get a subpoena for client records and they argue crime fraud, you can't even tell your client that you had gotten the subpoena, the administrative mm. subpoena. And that's becoming very common. And the real problem is the third party doctrine because they can search without you knowing about it. Right. So it's a, a, it's a real problem. So uh, you can't assert privilege, for example, if the government seizes records when you don't know they've done the search. There are lots of different ways to get compulsory process. This is just a list of some of them. Subpoenas, search warrants, FISA orders, uh, uh, non uh, uh, national security letters. All these are different ways to get copies of records that are stored online. We talked about the third party doctrine. Uh, what's interesting is in the Jones case with the GPS, uh, Justice Sotomayor recognized that this really fundamentally changes how we look at privacy and says at some point we're going to have to readdress the third party doctrine in light of new technology. Uh, and then internationally as well, we have the same problem. Uh, now, we have modified Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure to now allow a search warrant issued in the United States to allow the seizure of records that are seized overseas. When we look at this as a good thing. We say, look at these botnet armies from, from Russia and how do we go about uh, seizing those records? But as a practical matter, what it means now is uh, Russian law enforcement can go get a search warrant from a Russian judge and start you know, burrowing in to your computer, not just to a third party provider, but actually forensically extracting data from your laptop. They can install remote access software, they can install remote forensic software, and start seizing records from your computer from anywhere in the world. So how do you, I would say, secure your data? Well, that's, that's the interesting the thing. You secure it against Russian hackers the same way you secure it against the FBI, which is encryption. Uh, that data is encrypted. And unfortunately, there is no way to protect your data against Russian hackers, foreign law enforcement officials, other hackers as well, uh, without keeping it, uh, keeping it exposed to lawful process by US government officials with lawful process and preventing it from being taken uh, by the bad guys. The technology doesn't know the difference between good and bad guys. The technology doesn't know if the bits are being copied by somebody who wants to do something good with them or something bad with them. And so the, the the problem you have is that you cannot secure them against one without securing them against the other. There may be some, some way to do it in the future, but it doesn't exist right now. The other problem is, is uh, what I call the Trojan horse problem. Mm -hmm. So when you have a computer that has, let's say, child pornography on it, ultimately what you're trying to demonstrate is that this particular defendant downloaded this child pornography knowingly and willingly. Okay. That's fine. So you're going to look at a lot of data about the data. Did they use a user ID and password? Were they actually at their computer doing other things? The problem is that the stuff that you don't look for. So for example, almost every computer is going to have some kind of virus or worm or malware on it, unless they're doing a really good job of preventing it. A lot of that malware will allow remote access to the computer. If you have a computer that has remote access to it, there's absolutely no forensic way to demonstrate that that person did what you cl claim that they did. Unless you go back and retrieve all of the forensic data. And, and so one of the problems we have is not so much that people, not just that people will be able to get off by claiming the, the 
what I call the Trojan horse defense, but also that people will get convicted for crimes that they didn't do because others are setting them up for it. And the most recent one was a series of what are called cyber swatting events, where people would call 911 using caller ID spoofing, which is very easy to forensically determine. But the police would then show up, and recently in a case about two weeks ago, Somebody showed up, the police showed up at somebody's house and killed them, mm -hmm. uh, even though they had nothing to do with it because they were cyber swatting. Right. So one of the problems with cyber forensics is that we take this stuff too seriously. We believe it shows what it shows, even when it doesn't show that. Mark brings up a good point, authenticating the source. Mm -hmm. Where did this come from? And in some cases, you can look on a computer and say, okay, five minutes before the, the metadata says that these pictures hit a hard drive, we had a search in a browser for child pornography. Or, you know, two minutes before, you know, some other event, you may have a corresponding event found on that same device that, you know, ties those two events together. So uh, in, in terms of us, it's not just looking at one piece of evidence, but the totality of the circumstances, I think, is, is important in the overall scheme. Being able of, to map out where, you know, what occurred when and then showing that there is some kind of tie-in, not exactly. something, you know, wasn't that a, the um, Trojan horse thing? Wasn't there a case in London, I think? There were three what, cases yeah, in that's London. That's what I was going to say. And, okay. and I, I think it was called Macmillan was the name of the case and the guy was able to demonstrate. One of the problems you have in these hacker cases is these hackers are constantly attacking each other's computers and they are actually affirmatively trying to change forensic evidence. Um, and so we have things like anti-forensics, where you can modify forensic evidence, and people are trying to do that all the time. So we're used to dealing with a static crime scene, where the crime scene is what it purports to be. In forensic uh, digital evidence, the, the crime scene is dynamic, and there are people actually trying to create uh, the illusion that somebody else committed the crime. And they're also trying to steer evidence away from themselves. Mm -hmm. So we have both of that going on. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the book, I, I forgot what it was, Presumed Innocence. It wasn't just that there was DNA evidence. It was that somebody planted DNA yeah, evidence right. at the scene. And there are ways to do that, even more sophisticated ways now. In the digital environment, unless you're willing to look three, four, five, ten layers deep, you're not going to notice the planted forensic evidence. So another issue you have is you have, uh, you, you seize a, a, a phone and it's encrypted and you want to compel the owner of the phone to decrypt the data. Uh, now it's interesting that from a forensic standpoint, a fingerprint or a retina scan or a facial recognition is much stronger security than say a simple four digit pin. But from a legal standpoint, it's the other way around mm -hmm. because it's easy to compel somebody to produce a fingerprint or to produce a face. We do that all the time in regular criminal cases. But to force them to give up a password is much more difficult. And so what we end up with is a situation when we try to compel them to decrypt the data. We have a whole body of law about self-incrimination that says you can't compel them to speak, but you can compel them to give a fingerprint. So we have this dichotomy between what is forensic and uh, forensically secure and what's legally secure. Um, so just a few other issues, and, and this is the big part uh, that we talk about, just at the broad 10,000 foot level. When you're talking about the admissibility of forensic evidence, there are really four things that you're looking at. First thing is, is it relevant to my case? And that's really a question for the court to determine in the individual case. But from a, from a seizure of evidence, you have to try to think of everything that might be relevant to your case. And there's a lot more out there that you would, whether it's a webcam, whether it's a traffic cam, whether it's GPS records, whether it's any of these digital breadcrumbs, there's going to be a tremendous amount of information that might be relevant to your case that you hadn't thought of. So that's the first thing. Then you have to think about how am I going to obtain it? And, am I, and the next thing is authenticity. Now, the rule on authentication is very simple in concept and difficult in practicality. Authentication basically means the thing is what it purports to be. This is the email that Alice sent to Bob. Um, this is the child pornography that was downloaded to this computer. The next is that it is the best evidence, which raises a real problem. So let's say Alice sends an email to Bob, 
and you want to introduce that into evidence. Where would you look for it? On Alice's computer? On Bob's computer? On um, some cloud server? And which one's the original? And these concepts of an original mean much less when we talk about forensic evidence, and yet juries and judges are used to thinking about an original file. And that's also true, uh, as, as Josh pointed out, that records get modified as they travel through the system. And so you want the, the file that has the most evidence that is most relevant to your case. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Alice sending the email to Bob, and you ask yourself, which is the original? Question is, what am I trying to prove? Am I trying to prove that Alice sent an email? Then the one on Alice's computer is the most relevant one. If I'm trying to prove that Bob received an email, then the one on Bob's computer may be the most important. And if I'm trying to prove that Bob read the email, then I may want to look somewhere else on the computer to see whether the file was accessed. So, Or do you want to prove what is the information in the email? Then we have hearsay um, issues right. as well. And, and, so. and the other, you know, one of the interesting things when you talk about hearsay issues with electronic evidence is almost all electronic evidence has the problem of, of being hearsay. And we don't go through the steps necessary to establish the business records or other exceptions to the hearsay requirement. So when you have the emails uh, that you say you subpoenaed them, uh, not through a forensic manner, but you subpoenaed the, the emails uh, from Google, what witness are you going to put on the witness stand to testify that that email was created in the ordinary course of business? The answer is none. So you're going to end up putting somebody from Google to say, I don't know how this was created, by whom it was created. All I know is once it hit our servers, we stored it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's half a forensic investigation, but not a full forensic investigation. So when we talk about best evidence or authentication, those things are very difficult to do with electronic evidence. And that gets back to the processes that, that, um, that Josh was talking about, where, where he talked about basically from the beginning, from the, you can only authenticate and show um, um, non-modification from the time you walk in to the time you walk into court. And most of what happens with that electronic evidence happened long before that. You get to that evidence when it's already been through multiple computers, multiple modifications, multiple changes. All you can say is, this was the same as when I first saw it, which may be weeks, months, years from the time it was created. On the other hand, <clears throat> we, we take this stuff too seriously. And I, I don't mean this to be flippant, but we admit forensic evidence all the time without thinking about it. If you look at your phone bill and you want to get your phone bill into evidence, nobody testifies about the software that was used to create Generate the phone it. bill right. and how it was generated and how it was stored. You say, is this your phone bill? Yes, it's in. If you don't want it in through the person whose phone it is, you put it in the phone company uh, witness and you say, is this the phone bill? And they say, yes. So in many ways, we make this much more complicated for ordinary business records but we also simplify it too much for contested records. So that's, I think that's the big takeaway in forensics is when you talk about admissibility, it's like the video of the, uh, of the Boston bombing scene. If you put somebody who was there and say, what's that? That's the crime scene. It actually comes in. Everything else goes to wait. So we can get it in, and yet as forensic people, we're used to challenging it and saying, well, where did it come from? I don't know where it came from, but I recognize it as the crime scene. So we have this duality between wanting strong technical evidence to authenticate it and this idea of, yes, but I know what it is. Interesting. Now, what about um, when we're thinking about some of the admissibility issues? Um, also, with the federal rules of evidence, they recognize that electronic evidence is part of the evidence code, and the code does affect it. Are there any states that you've run across that have really, I would say, um, more far-reaching uh, evidence rules or statutes on point for this type of evidence? What's interesting is most of the rules that you deal with that deal with <clears throat> electronic evidence deal with a subset of electronic evidence which I call e-discovery. Mm -hmm. And e-discovery forensics and electronic evidence are related topics, but they're not the same. So what we're talking about when we talk about e-discovery is how do you 
obtain records, how do you authenticate records, and how do you admit those records into evidence. Forensics, there's a forensics uh, aspect of e-discovery. Because what happens in e-discovery is you might take 10,000 emails, put them onto a server, and say, give me all the emails from this person to this person during this time period. And the machine, which is essentially a black box, spits out something. Mm -hmm. And the forensics is proving what the black box did. But the underlying records are still subject to challenges of authenticity. Most of the rules of evidence deal with how we establish authenticity, how we establish re relevance, how we establish non-repudiation. Those are the big things that we deal with. But most of, most of the rules of evidence deal with e-discovery. Right, and there was the American Bar Association actually did here at Stetson a um, program on e-discovery. So that is a hot topic, which is, I think, a little bit outside of what we're covering it is, today. You, sh you should be very careful when you talk about e-discovery and, and forensics, mm -hmm. because a lot of people talk about e-discovery as being a for the forensics. And there are forensic aspects of e-discovery, but it is not, not the same thing. Right. And the people who are certified in e-discovery forensics are not the people you want to be using for the forensics in terms of testimony. They can tell you how they sliced and diced the data, uh, how they've obtained it, but they're not going to tell you how somebody else did mm -hmm. and how you extract the data. Right, so it's very, you have to be very careful about what kind of experts you're going to, I guess, employ in your case. And certifications are critically important as well, but they're problematic. First thing is that every data extraction company that makes hardware or software is going to certify you in how to use their tool. Right, which is what right. Josh was talking about, right. which is different than, say, board certification by exactly. a um, professional association, for example. And just being certified to, in how to use the tool doesn't mean you know what the tool does. So you have a lot of people who are certified in, like, NCASE, mm -hmm. which is a data extraction tool. But when, when it gets down to it, you know, uh, Josh talked about what's called a write blocker. And a write blocker is a device that you, either hardware or software device, and it's actually both, that you put on a uh, suspect uh, machine to make sure you don't write to it and change the data. And it works great, except if you turn the computer on. When you turn the computer on, you've already modified the data on it in some ways. Uh, so that's the first thing you have to understand, how you've modified the data. Modifying the data is not fatal as long as you can explain it. Right. But people will say, it's, it's sort of like the people who are certified in how to use a, ra a radar gun or a LIDAR gun. They may know the, how to operate it, but that doesn't mean they understand the science or the physics behind it. And we're now getting so sophisticated that we can use um, not just uh, uh, tele uh, microscopes to be able to examine media. But, you know, you go back, the media we looked at 30 years ago was magnetic media. And we were actually looking at uh, the, the alignment of uh, iron molecules. Then we moved from magnetic media to floppy drives, which were also magnetic. Then we moved from that to optical drives. Then we moved from optical drives to solid state drives. Right? And we keep changing the technology, and the forensics has to keep pace with that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's running uh, to catch up, I think, many yeah. times. It's a good point he brings up as well with, with vendor-level tools. You may not be able to know what that vendor-level tool goes or does because of proprietary means. They may mm -hmm. want to protect that, how they access that cell phone. The, the most important thing behind an examiner is do they follow that process to the point where they're not spoiling the evidence? Mm -hmm. And that's the important part and the takeaway of this is, okay, are they doing what they were trained to do? And that's, that's the, I guess, the important part. Or and at least, documenting every step of this, I think that's... At likely. least to a certain extent, you know, to, so they can recreate that down the road. Um, the, the issue that Mark points out is sometimes we put some of this under such intense scrutiny when we don't have to. For example, if I ask for call detail records, are we going to uh, assume that every person that views a call detail record is going to be an expert on every single field in that call detail record or everything that their tool spits out in a report? That's almost impossible to, to expect out of any examiner that's practicing in the field. Now, if you really need that data, call an expert in that knows call detail records that it can explain triangulation of call details and, and what towers they connected to and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems you have is you have the battle of the experts. You'll have two different experts give the same opinion, different opinions on the same evidence. Uh, and that, that can be very difficult, uh, especially in new fields. The other right. problem with being certified is that 
if you're certified in a particular device or a particular version, uh, you have to keep that certification up. Otherwise, right. and, and with so many different extraction tools and so many different methodologies, you can spend your whole time doing nothing but being certified. And at the end of the day, the, the question is, did the, the extraction tool extract the data in a way that didn't change it? And then what does that data show? And both of those are very difficult concepts to be able to prove because at the end of the day, even to the trained forensic examiner, a lot of this is a black box. I did the right things in the right way and it spit out this data. And therefore I assume that this data came from that because this is, this, that's what it's supposed to do. But we can't make assumptions. That's one of the that's problems. The problem. but, well, I know with our, with our time, Mark, I yep. was wondering if you have a couple more of your slides, what you want to hit the high points. Of course, all of these slides will be posted um, on our website. That's ncstl.org um, in our education and training page. But if you want to make a few more you, points. I only want to make one, one, one sh other sharp point, and that is about chain of custody. We are all, as uh, examining forensics, we're all used to the idea of chain of custody and how critically important chain of custody is. And I'm going to say two things that are diametrically opposed to each other. The first one is chain of custody is critically important. And second of all, chain of custody is not critically important. And both of those are absolutely true. Because chain of custody is important to be able to demonstrate that this data that you're testifying about in court is what it purports to be. It came from that particular device. It hasn't been modified, altered in any way. And therefore, chain of custody is important to keep records of, and to be able to testify. On the other hand, there's what I call the manna from heaven problem. You have a record. You have no idea where it was, which is the, the thing that you find on the internet. You don't know what it is. You don't know how it was created. You know nothing about it. And even then, you will be able to authenticate it for a particular purpose. So while chain of custody is very important, there are ways to deal with breaks of chain of custody. There are ways to de deal with modifications of chain of custody. So take it seriously, but it's not going to be fatal. Great. Okay. Um, well, this is, I have to say, a very timely topic and one I think this is only one of in terms of webinars that we're going to do. Um, but I was telling both Mark and Josh that uh, just the latest, believe it or not, National Geographic had a whole article series of articles are Big Brother is watching, which we've heard of before. But again, what is it? They are watching. And what we should do is be aware that there's many um, types of media that <laughs> Being, we're watching, what we watch is being watched. Um, and I think that's something that we have to consider. And I think we could probably talk more on cybersecurity and privacy interests, I think, in an additional webinar. Um, but anyway, I want to thank all of you for joining us on today's webinar. Uh, please continue to check the spotlight section of our homepage, that's ncstl.org, for any information on upcoming webinars. We do live training and we do our webinars as well. Um, all webinars available on demand, so if you have a colleague that was not able to watch because they were in court today, please tell them to visit our on-demand page. Um, the education and training page will have how to access this, and you can still get your CLE credits as well. Uh, please make sure that you fill out a survey that you'll receive by email. This will enable you to receive your CLE information, and please contact our Office of Professional Education, that's OPE at law.stetson.edu, for any questions you may have. On behalf of the Stetson University College of Law, the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and Law, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is part of OJP and DOJ, and my guest speakers, I want to thank all of you for attending our particular webinar. Thank you, and look for us in the future.